Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Marzia Zafar. I work at the World Energy Council as Director of Innovation and Issues Monitor. Uh, I will be your moderator for this webinar, and this is your webinar. I'll, I'll explain it in, in a bit. I am joined here by my colleague, Pauline Blanc, Manager of Innovation here at the Council. Um, this webinar, uh, let me give you a brief uh, background, one minute or so, and then we'll get into questions. So the Council has conducted a series of thought leadership interviews with energy executives from 17 countries to understand the opportunities and obstacles around energy storage. Why did we do this? Uh, well, because decarbonization and, and decentralization depends on a robust set of energy storage technologies that can bring not only hourly, but daily, weekly, and seasonal storage. What we learned from these interviews, we conducted 39 uh, interviews from 17 countries, um, is that the power sector is narrowly focused, is focusing on, on just battery storage. So thus far, there's a limited progress in developing daily, weekly, and even seasonal cost-effective solutions um, that are indispensable if we're gonna move to this deeper and deeper decarbonization and, and decentralization. So we asked these energy executives, what should the market do to advance not just battery storage, but the number of other energy storage technologies that are in developing stages and, and they need the attention and, and the investment necessary to commercialize them. So we have put forth, based on these interviews, we have put forth a five-step guide to enabling all the values and all the technologies of energy storage. With me uh, this morning are three uh, guest experts whose companies took part in the interview process and are here to answer your questions. Let me quickly introduce our experts and then I will turn the floor uh, to everyone who's joined um, the webinar. What I'd like for you to do is, um, if you have a question, go ahead and, and submit your question through the question function. Then I'll go ahead and read them aloud, direct it to one of our guest speakers. Um, so again, let me just quickly introduce our, our, our guest speakers. Our first speaker, again, expert guest is Medina Mohavana. I hope I pronounced that correctly. Sorry if I didn't. Uh, market manager for Fluence. Uh, Fluence is the leading global energy storage technology and services company with over 1,600 megawatts of operational or co uh, contracted ener energy storage in more than 21 countries. Next, we have Julian Jensen, research and analysis manager focusing on energy storage for IHS, for IHS market. IHS market leads global research on stationary energy storage and provides deep insight into the, on the key value drivers and emerging business models accelerating storage deployment across Europe and North America. And our third and final uh, expert guest is Maximilian Schumacher. Business Development Manager for Innovative Technologies at Siemens Gamesa Renewable Energy. Siemens Gamesa is a leading supplier of wind power solutions to customers all over the globe. So again, I, I want to emphasize that we've opened this webinar for questions to be to come from the uh, from from you who've joined and participated. So please use the question function. Send us your questions. In the meantime, I will go. I have one question for each of our. Uh, guest experts, I will go ahead and ask those, and then I'm going to rely on on you uh, to to give me questions. So the first question is to Julian uh, from IHS Market. Uh, Julian, what is one of the key trends you have observed in the energy storage space recently? Yeah, I think it's a it's a great question, and you know I think there's there's not just one single trend. There's a lot of different um, levels of innovation and things happening uh, within the industry. But I think one thing that is certainly becoming more and more important in the discussion that we're having with stakeholders from across the globe is really how much of a pivotal role energy storage plays in enabling more resilient and reliable electricity networks. And I think really what the outcome of that is, is that we see that without significant deployment of long duration and bulk energy storage, we will not meet the clean energy policy goals that different governments and stakeholders across the industry have set out. Um, you know, we're already seeing that more than half the states in the U.S. have adopted renewable energy goals. You know, states like California targeting 100% clean energy by 2020, uh, 2045. And really the need for storage and especially long duration bulk storage will become more pressing 
And I think it's really evidenced by the amounts of curtailed renewable energy that we're seeing um, and really trying to understand how we can better match the supply of such abundant low cost renewable generation with the demand throughout the year um, to ensure really reliable um, re reliable um, power supply and making sure that storage plays a clear role um, in enabling that. I think the other point that's really kind of come out and it kind of goes hand in hand with that, if we look at some of the kind of devastating um, natural disasters that we've seen over the last um, year or so, you know, wildfires in California and Australia, we've had hurricanes devastate Puerto Rico and the Bahamas, um, and really, we think that storage um, and, and actually stakeholders across the industry see that storage can play a key role in, while not preventing these, of course, but help restore power in the event of such a fire and make sure that electricity networks become more resilient um, to ensure that, you know, crucial supplies, um, crucial industries keep functioning. People don't go without power for days and days um, on end and really help rebuild in the aftermath of such natural disasters. And I think those two elements together really show to, to the key role that storage plays in enabling resilient, reliable electricity networks um, and how it has to be integrated um, by especially the regulators to, to um, accelerate the development and accelerate the frameworks that enable storage to play into those markets and really fulfill the role it can play um, in doing so. Thank you, Julian, and thank you for pointing out that the need for bulk storage is going to get bigger and bigger as we continue to decentralize and decarbonize. My next question is to uh, Maximilian, uh, Max, Maximilian Schumacher. Um, we included Siemens Gamesa's electrothermal energy storage system as one of our case studies. Uh, can you briefly explain how the technology works and why we, mean, we need this type of storage uh, in the future? Sure. Um, yeah. So let me start with why we developed something like that. Because we said, okay, as Julian perfectly mentioned, we, in the future, and if you think about energy systems with a high penetration of renewables, we need storage. And we need a lot of storage. And for example, what you see here is um, we simply met, okay, what kind of storage technologies do we have in the market or do we have in the market um, quite soon? And um, so what is the energy, so the, the storage capacity they can provide and the power? And we came up with something like that. And what we perfectly see here right now is um, that batteries have right now a crucial market in the range of, let's say, double digit megawatts in terms of power and up to, say, 100, 120, 50, sometimes 200 megawatt hours in terms of storage capacity. And, and we see also that in, and we think about high penetrations, about high storage capacities, for sure hydrogen will be um, a very crucial um, role in the system. However, what we also see is there's something missing in the middle and between batteries and hydrogen applications. And that's the reason why we developed something like, like ETHER, like the electric thermal energy storage. If you could um, go forward, please, in the presentation. Yeah. And so, and we said, okay, if you think about a storage technology um, for large scale um, storage capacity, we have to think about a storage material which is incredibly cheap and which is globally available. And that's the reason why we uh, took volcanic stones. So the core is a thermal storage component. And if you want to charge the storage component, you can use a um, heat source available, or you can use electricity which we turn by a resistive heater into heat. And then we simply blow hot air into the storage. And if you want to discharge the storage, we blow cold air into the storage. There, the heat is transferred to the, to the air. And then we use a simple um, water steam cycle um, to, to turn the heat into electricity again. And this is, this, this is very crucial that we are using a water steam cycle because this technology is used since decades, actually since over 100 years uh, in the electricity industry. And th this is the beauty of the system. You can use the ETHIS technology in order to convert existing power plants into emission-free storage facilities. So we can use existing infrastructure and make them the enabler of 100% renewable 
um, energy system. If, if you skip forward, please, you see this is not just a nice PowerPoint or a crazy idea, it's reality. We are doing it. We have a test site since 2014, and since last year, June, we have a demonstrator, a full system, including not just the storage component, but also the, the charging cycle and discharging cycle. And that's in operation now since um, roughly half a year. And yeah. Uh, thank you so much. Um, I'm going to now ask one question from uh, 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 from Medina, and then I have like four questions from the audience that I, that I will I will ask afterwards. So Medina, um, from I wanted to ask you, uh, working for a leading global energy storage technology and service provider, who is your typical customer, and what are the energy storage services that they are most interested in, and and how was this changed in the past few years. Thank you, Marzia, and good morning to everyone on the line. So I'm um, answering the first question. It's typically market specific as it depends on the storage market regulation. Um, let me give you a couple of examples. If there is a certain way of being paid for the storage services like in Europe, UK, um, there is a market for storage. And the most, in the most cases, these are private market customers who develop projects, own and operate and provide the services to the grid. If there is no specific market, but there is a certain need for storage, uh, a business case, the, the customers in many cases are the developers who provide, for example, a standalone or a hybrid solution to utilities and national power companies or some other private off takers. And... Uh, with the decrease of the battery storage costs over the years, we've seen all types of applications and have co-located battery systems with different generation assets, as well as on a transmission and distribution level. In many cases, applications directly related to an intermittency of the renewable energy power sources and needs to meet peak hours demand, as Julian mentioned as well. Therefore, just to name such applications like frequency regulation, voltage control, Spinning reserve, spinning capacity, other ones that we see uh, uh, widely developed in the market, in the different markets. And in this context, the use of battery storage systems, both for large scale and small scale, as well as short duration and long duration projects, has been proven to be commercially feasible and supported by the other advantages of such systems, such as modularity, short development period, fast responding capability, and reliability. Of Okay, thank you so much. Now I have a, a question from William, uh, who joined, uh, who's a participant. William is asking, and I think Julian, it would be uh, best, uh, most appropriate if you answer this: How much energy storage is needed before the intermittency of renewables is no longer a concern? And maybe oh. if you could, if you could, yeah. Julian, also discuss maybe the types are, do we need to rely on just one type of storage or do we need to be looking at all sorts of storage? Absolutely. I think it's a, it's a really good question. And I think unfortunately there isn't, you know, just one answer to it because a lot of it will depend on what other flexibility you have on a network. Because when we look at intermittent renewables, it's not, not just about deploying a huge amount of energy storage to basically time shift that generation. It's also much more around generating flexibility, um, also from a demand side in the energy network, um, and basically making sure that we better match supply and demand, that we exploit all flexibility, whether that's from storage, whether that's for the, from demand response, whether that's from other distributed generation resources that would exist. So really, it's, it's something that you need to look at much more holistically. And as such, I, I would say there isn't just one answer of how much storage you will need um, in terms of matching that intermittency. That said, I do think it's really important to understand that as we increase the share of intermittent renewables, and this is probably not going to happen in the next five years, this is much longer term as we're getting closer and closer to these 100% renewable targets, um, is a point where we need to start integrating longer duration storage. And I think that really enables the, the field for all types of technologies, 
or, or yeah, for, for different technologies to play a key role. Um, and I think that's going to be the time when we see the market moving beyond um, lithium ion batteries that are the dominant technology um, in the market today. So, you know, I think with, with that said, it's really more of a time horizon kind of 10 plus years where we'll see a lot more alternative technologies, a lot more long duration. So intraday, potentially even um, in, yeah, intraday, um, between days or even seasonal storage playing a role. And I think that will play that will enable different technologies to play a role, whether that's a resurgence of pumped hydro, whether that's you know, new novel technologies such as liquid air energy storage, whether that's alternative battery technologies, they all have a role to play. I think the other piece that I would also say is we focus a lot on the electricity sector in these discussions, but actually, you know, when we're looking at it holistically, we need to decarbonize the entire energy sector. Um, and as part of that, heat plays a massive role. Decarbonizing heat um, in, in many countries, especially in Northern Europe, is a huge challenge because we use a lot of gas-based um, or gas boilers for our heating needs. Um, just as one example, in industrial processes, a lot of the heat pro or the heat um, generation is done through um, highly carbon intensive generation. So in all those sectors, we need to look at a much wider strategy for decarbonizing. And I think that's where technologies such as thermal storage will also have a crucial role to play um, to help us decarbonize beyond the power sector. Thank you so much. Um, the next question, um, I think, uh, Medina, if you could respond to this. Um, the question is uh, from William, do we have enough natural resources to build storage capability needed for the energy transition? Uh, I'll give it a try, Marzio. Uh, well, the, as we all know, the storage resources are in general, uh, the, the resources for batteries specifically, they are limited. However, the researchers say that this is sufficient for the next 50, 100 years. And uh, I agree with Julian. Uh, we also, let's say, the fluids with 13 years of experience in battery and storage system design and providing it to the third parties. We, we keep our technology philosophy, technology agnostic. The reason behind is that the industry is changing so fast and there are different alternatives and a lot of different batteries being developed. There is a lot of R&D going on from the battery manufacturers and especially with the, let's say, EV, EV market being focused on um, on also transitioning to so the, the auto industry transitioning to the uh, electrical vehicles. Uh, this all brings us to the point that the future in 10 15 years will change. Uh, therefore, I think the concern should be not about the resources, but how to address and transition uh, to the to to, ha to have more renewables in the in the systems and make this transition smooth. That uh, there will be no power outages for the customers. That there will be, uh, let's say, a reliable power supply for for the end customers for sure. Uh, thank you so much, Medina. Um, Maximilian, a question from uh, Pedro is, um, which storage technologies do you see uh, being commercialized in the next five to 10 years that's beyond battery storage? Um, yeah, that, that's a good question. Of course, um, we, we think that thermal storage will be a crucial role and we are right now commercializing it. Um, we also see um, Redox low batteries coming up, um, and I think these these two will be the the next technologies which will be commercialized. Um, on a longer run, there yeah, I see more maybe capacitors, but um, yeah, we have to see how they develop. Thank you so much. Um, we our next question is uh, from Lebanon, from uh, one of our colleagues, one of our. Uh, Lebanon MCs, do you think storage unit sizes and the technologies used would be influenced by the tendency to decentralize electricity generation? Uh, I think I'm going to pose that to both uh, Maximilian and Julian, if you guys don't mind responding to that. I'll, I'll go ahead and repeat that and the question again. Um, do you think that storage uh, unit sizes and the technologies used would be influenced by the tendency to decentralize electricity generation? 
Yeah, I think it's a it's a fantastic question. I think um, something we're seeing right now is actually contradicting that kind of um, thought process. Is right now we're seeing a massive increase in um, storage system sizes, and that's really driven by the applications that are becoming feasible, especially in the US, um, around um, replacing peaking capacity. And we're seeing battery storage systems that are, you know, 100 megawatt plus um, for our duration. Um, so very much kind of going in the direction of great, uh, greater system size and larger systems. But I think at the same time, the, the point there is, is very clear as well, that as we see um, uh, energy systems decentralized and customers taking more responsibilities of the power supply, we will st still see a crucial role of behind the meter and distributed storage systems. I think really the question here is how do regulatory frameworks um, allow for those systems to be integrated into the wider um, power network? And I think that's the role that, that regulators um, and that policymakers really have to decide. The way that um, power systems are set up right now is really favoring larger um, centralized assets still. And it's not favoring or enabling um, of a large fleet of decentralized assets to provide the same services. And once or until that barrier is overcome, I think we will still see this kind of more of a focus on the larger um, end of the spectrum. But once we get into that, that element where policymakers and regulators will enable that and create opportunities for decentralized assets to play into power markets, into wholesale markets, then I think we will see a, a shift or at least a more evening out of the development there. Thank you, thank you. Um, Maximilian, did you want to add to that or uh, I have about five more questions left from the audience? Oh, he answered already perfectly, so uh, let's give it a try for the next slide. Okay, um, another question, this is from Medina. Uh, uh, James asks, when talking about batteries, Medina, everyone refers to value stacking. Uh, can you first explain how this value stacking works and how to make it, um, you know what are its biggest challenges, and, and what are some of uh, what are some opportunities for it? Um, sure. Um, so under the value stacking, we're understanding the uh, understanding what kind of services the storage can provide in this specific case, and uh, that can be uh, that. Can, so th th in this case, we would consider a different aspect of having a storage in the system. Both it, it includes technical uh, assessment, uh, it's commercial, it's environmental impact. It's also, uh, let's say, if, if the storage is providing some uh, services to help with the demand management, if let's say it's a CNI uh, customer who have to avoid losses in production, uh, such, such uh, this will also be added into the value of the storage system. And in this case, we will have to consider the business case as, as, a, as a, let's say, a one sum of this all benefits of having storage in the system. What is uh, interesting, um, if, if we are talking about the decentralization of the energy, uh, there are benefit from storage of having um, it to provide the specific services, but through the operation, there are additional benefits of having storage. Therefore, the value comes um, not only when you assess the storage system before, but also when you already deployed it, You uh, usually what we see, the customer also learn that there are more benefits than they counted for before. Hope this responds to the question. I think I think so. Um, the next question is uh, uh, from France, and um, I'm not going to begin to pronounce the name because I'll, I'll mispronounce it. So the opinion on behind the meter storage, how will it develop in the next five to ten years? What is the required regulatory framework um, and policies for this? So again, um, the opinion on behind the meter storage. How will it develop in the next five to 10 years? Are we going to have basically uh, every garage is going to have a, a, a battery storage in there? Is that the case or what is the, and then what is the required regulatory framework and policies to make this happen behind the meter? Uh, Maximilian, do you want to respond to that? Sure, but I, I think uh, Madina can answer this um, much better because we are not behind the meter. Okay, perfect. Yeah, uh, large scale storage applications. So. Okay. Medina, uh, would you like to respond to that or sh should I move it to Julian? 
I, I can respond to that and maybe Julian can comment uh, as well. Okay. So uh, in, I, I think Behind the Meter has a very interesting development currently because, um, of course, it depends on the market. If you look at the it, it's Germany, where, for example, there are high demand chargers and our, let's say, potential business cases for storage, this, there is a huge potential for that. On the other hand, if you look at the African market, um, and uh, let's say as an example, South Africa, where they have, um, let's say, uh, under the one uh, megawatt uh, um, possibility to install, and uh, this market has been already, let's say, more developed, and there is counted about a couple of gigawatts of uh, let's say solar and in some cases storage as well behind the meter and there are discussions going on to increase this uh, cap because uh, there is a need to have the in-house own generation for many uh, customers uh, and I think there is a future for that how it will evolve it's a big question but um, in general the market follows the need and I am sure that decentralization and understanding of the um, let's say overall benefits of having in own uh, generation. It, it's certainly a way for more reliable power supply in many countries and in many markets. Okay, thank you so much. Um, another question, I think um, this is, uh, maybe if we could go to, uh, to Julian on this. Uh, so Claire asks, uh, in terms of uh, this, this notion of a 100% uh, renewable energy world, how feasible is that? And uh, and does that mean that we will have to rely on on not just one type of storage, but on all type of storage? And sorry if the question is too long. Um, uh, the follow up to that is: Should we should we for resiliency and reliability uh, concerns that you mentioned earlier? Should we focus on more than just 100% renewable energy? Well, I think. Well, fundamentally, I think it is feasible, but I think what, what people forget is we, we always look at this, and this is maybe the, the nature of the energy industry and, and old energy, so to speak. We always look at this in silos and in isolated ways, but really we need to look at the whole decarbonization, not just of the power sector, but of the wider energy sector, as well as things like transport, um, and really understand what opportunities there, there are around sector coupling and what te technologies will play a role. And kind of not just think about we're going to generate all our electricity from abundant solar and wind um, and kind of store it in big batteries because that's certainly not the future um, that we'll be going towards and the future that is probably most desirable desirable both economically and, and socially so I think from that perspective it's all about understanding how sector coupling um, and how bringing those different sectors and industries together in an effective way and how we can holistically plan to best optimize demand and supply of power um, uh, alongside all those other industries to kind of achieve that vision of 100% um, renewable power supply um, and decarbonizing our, our well, society and energy system as a whole. So I think that's the kind of first point. I think the second point around reliability and resilience, I think, you know, it's a very easy way of saying, you know, let's just kind of over oversize the, the need in terms of um, um, solar and, and wind for example there's also understanding how different again how different technologies play together different sectors play together i think at the same time people um look at this kind of from that side that you know overall reliability of the energy sector we will need um long duration and bulk storage to secure when we look at some of those examples i mentioned around natural disasters actually um lots of dis distributed small scale solar and battery storage can really help um, bring back power and actually increases the resilience compared to the type of energy system that we're used to, where we have one centralized plan, we're relying on transmission infrastructure to bring that across. And once that fails, for whatever reason, we have a huge problem and people will then be without power until that is restored. Well, as soon as we have more distributed um, and customer sited um, renewables and storage, more microgrids, more integration of demand versus supply at a local level, that's when we actually increase the resilience of our system rather than decrease it. Thank you so much. Uh, Maximilian, this question is specifically for you. Ben asks, uh, and, and I think you mentioned that, that your technology is already commercialized. Is the technology by Siemens a Gamasa technology of the future? 
um, do we really need it today and is it cost effective today? Um, yeah, thanks for the question. Um, for sure, it, it, it is a crucial part of, let's say, a future energy system. And to answer the question whether we need it, if you just think about the incredible amount of storage capacity we need in the future, if you think a height of high penetration of renewables in the system, just to take uh, Germany as an example, we have an average um, electricity, just electricity demand of um, roughly um, 60 gigawatt. If you think about it, we have to cover this demand, let's say two days in January, where we ha have hardly sun, especially in northern Germany, and sometimes also no wind. We, we are talking about 60 gigawatt times um, 48 hours. And these storage capacities must be provided by some technology. And we, we are, we are convinced that this can only be done by large-scale storage applications. And to answer the questions regarding the cost, since we are using existing infrastructure, half of our capex of our technology is made up of the water steam cycle, the, the heavy equipment, the, the steam turbine and the electric generator. And since we are using existing infrastructure, so an existing um, water steam cycle, um, we, we are very cost competitive and of course our capex is much lower than um, of batteries. Also because our storage material is taken directly from the pit and brought into the storage component. We, have, we don't pre-process our storage material. Thank you so much. Um, this question is, the next one is to Medina. I think you're, uh, you're probably going to know this already uh, from Lebanon. Reem asks, from your experience in terms of contracts like power purchase agreements, is it always better to consider a renewable energy with storage as a single contract or is it better to have them separate? What is the common practice? Uh, I'll, I'll respond to Reem uh, regarding the battery storage systems that I know. So, so far, the answer I would say it's typically one contract but it can be true as well. It depends on the financing aspects uh, and let's say how, who is the owner, how the project is developed. But what I've seen is in most cases, let's say in most cases, these are uh, under the one PPA. On the other hand, um, case that there is, let's say, there is a certain way of having it differently paid. And if this is the question, then it might be the case that sometimes the customer split the PPA into the into the two um, two parts, let's say, one for solar and one for BES, but under the same contract. What, what I mean is um, sometimes there are projects when you understand that you might not need the storage for 25 years because things are changing through the lifetime of the project. And might, you ne might need uh, storage for 15 years instead of, uh, let's say, typical solar lifetime. Um, therefore, in this case, sometimes it's possible to have uh, storage as a part of the PPA, but for the full, uh, let's say, 30-year PPA, if it's for 25, 30-year PPA for, for solar. So I, I hope this responds to the question. I think it does. Thank you so much. And, and thank you to all our guest speakers. Uh, what I will end with is that while uh, the next, this, the first 35 minutes was about technology, next week we're holding another webinar to discuss uh, the policy and regulatory aspects of unleashing energy storage. Um, so please, if you're interested, join us next week uh, on February 11th, um, and we can, we'll, we'll put it on Twitter and other social media platforms uh, to, to let you know if you would like to join. And um, I will end by saying that the World Energy Council is, promote, is technology neutral and policy neutral. Our mission is to promote a sustainable, reliable, affordable energy transition for all uh, for all countries and to that end we we take some of these specific technologies or policies to see if they can be replicated in other parts of the world and if we can identify best practices so with that thank you so much for joining us and please join in next week to talk about policy and regulatory for storage thank you everybody and thank you to our guest speakers thank you it was a pleasure thank you Bye. thank you thank you very much